Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Iraqi session of the World Economic Forum in the Middle East and North Africa. My name is Suna Vidinli. I'm an anchor for Turkey's leading network, NTV Television. I'll be moderating the panel today. We have four very important guests with us to discuss the future of Iraq. Uh, let me first introduce you my panelists. His Eminence Saeed Ammar al-Hakim is the chairman of the Supreme Islamic Council of Iraq. His Excellency Mr. Baker J. Zubaydi is the member of parliament of Iraqi National Assembly, also formerly the Minister of Finance of Iraq. We have His Excellency Mr. Saleh Mohammed Al Mutlaq, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq. And finally, Mr. Wadi Habush, President and CEO of Habush Group. Today we're going to discuss how Iraq is doing. Um, despite what the headlines of the news media project to the world, Iraq is actually a country that promises a uh, uh, significant growth in the coming years. We're going to discuss how Iraq can deliver this inclusive growth in light of the changes in the region and the current political and security landscape. We will see how different groups making up the Iraqi society could achieve that. In light of this introduction, I would like to start with his uh, eminence, Mr. Saeed Amar al-Hakim. Um, as we know, obviously, Iraq is made up of Shiites and Sunnis and also Kurdish region. There were in the past years a lot of uh, uh, confusion about how these sects were interacting with each other. We sometimes hear of the conflict as well. As the supreme leader, how do you see in the coming years your projection of the different sects interacting with each other for a common goal in Iraq, if we could start with that? In the name of God, most compassionate, most merciful. At the outset, uh, we would uh, like to extend our congratulations uh, to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, to its king, its government, and its people for the 67th anniversary of its independence. As to the question you raised, we hear a lot about Iraq. What uh, we hear may be positive or negative. Some of this may be true. Uh, some may only look at the half full glass, and the others may see only the empty half. And some may look at the partial picture. The crisis in Iraq uh, goes well beyond uh, the Iraqi borders. There is a regional situation in which uh, we see a rich uh, fabric of nationalities uh, and uh, religions. We find this in all countries in one manner or the other. Sometimes it is a composition of uh, Sunni and Shiite. Uh, sometimes it is Christians and Muslims. Sometimes it is an Islamist orientation and a civil orientation. There is uh, diversity and pluralism. This all means we have to reach uh, a consensual uh, point of view to know how we can live with each other. How can we judge issues in a manner that would bring in all these different groups and would give them a sense of confidence and security? The Iraqi situation with the presence of foreign forces on its territories, the way the regime was changed, all this led to many concerns uh, regionally and internationally. This placed major challenges before us over the last decade. And we all feel that we have taken important steps forward, and we have to continue this uh, process uh, with ad additional steps. The progress is major, but we need to achieve more, for we have major ambitions. Uh, Iraq is a rich country. It has a civilization that goes back 7,000 years. It has uh, huge human and material resources. If we can, as Iraqis, agree on a partnership of the strong and uh, seek out uh, the strong that would represent all the different components of this, of this country, and if we can, determine or decide on a security creed uh, that will go beyond a purely security or criminal approach uh, for the security situation is related not merely uh, to uh, the criminal aspect of uh, uh, the matter, but it is related to the broader structure of the country. It also includes the regional component and the countries of the region that may have their own fears of the situation and its repercussions. Therefore, we have to re- uh, 
draft uh, the security concept that can establish good neighborhood relations uh, with the neighboring countries and within the country itself between the different components in addition to the importance of a vision for development and for developing our services. All this will place Iraq on the right path. A new security concept for the neighboring region. I would like to turn to Mr. Zubaydi. When we talk about a security concept, obviously Iraq has uh, six neighbors. Uh, all of them, uh, we can say four Arabic and two Islamic ones. These two Islamic ones, one of them is obviously Turkey and the other one is Iran. As an experienced politician, how do you see Iraq in the coming years balancing out the different relations it has between Iran, its relations via vis Iran, and vis-a-vis -vis Turkey? <coughs> when we talk about Iraqi relations with the four Arab countries, the four neighboring Arab countries, is one matter. And uh, this dif is different uh, than a discussion of our two other neighboring countries, Turkey and Iran. When we go back into history, if we go back 400 years, for example, we shall find that Ottoman Turkey occupied Iraq and uh, and at other periods in time, the Safavid regime of uh, uh, Iran occupied uh, Iraq. But m modern Iraq, if it wants to have stability, it should have the best of relations with these two states, with Turkey and with Iran. For we have 1,450 kilometers uh, of borders uh, with the Islamic Republic of Iran and over 600 kilometers of borders with Turkey. In addition, we are in need of these two states in our commercial relations and exporting our oil through Turkish territories and in the future to export our gas through Turkey to Europe. And Iraq could be the link, the bridge between the Gulf countries and Europe through Turkey. Therefore, I believe having good relations and uh, to overcome any tensions that may arise now and then is the wise policy. And if it balances the relation with these two countries, it can overcome the crisis. Prime Minister Mr. Al Mutlak, obviously, when we talk about relations vis a vis Turkey, one cannot help but ask that they were deteriorating during uh, Maliki's uh, period. Turkey and Iran used to enjoy a considerable uh, smooth relation period, but then when Maliki came to power, uh, those relations have deteriorated. How do you, as a Deputy Prime Minister, evaluate that? Maliki, somehow, they seem, comes increasingly closer to Iran. And the Turkish foreign minister has been increasingly vocal about saying its criticisms towards uh, uh, Maliki. So I'd like to know your personal reaction to that relationship. In fact, since the U.S. occupation of Iraq and even prior to that period, our relations with Turkey were excellent. And these relations continued to be excellent until some politicians made certain declarations. These declarations angered some of the politicians in Turkey, especially when they were personalized. And this led to a situation of revenge and retaliation. It did not reflect a true problem between the two countries. There are common interests. Uh, Turkey cannot keep away from Iraq, nor can Iraq move away from Turkey. This is a strategic situation. We need water, and most of the sources of our waters are from Turkey. Turkey has a huge market in Iraq. Hence, it will be undermined if this market uh, is uh, undermined. I believe that uh, the whole problem arose uh, from certain statements made by some politicians, and this led uh, to a retaliation. 
In addition, the marginalization of certain parts of the population in Iraq is partly related to what is happening with Turkey. There are certain parties in the political process that are acting in a manner that was not the, u the norm. Uh, Turkey started to focus on the issue and wanted to set it straight. And this is a matter that has to be set straight anyway, no matter what the Turkish position is and no matter whether Turkey intervenes or not. We have to set straight our internal relations. This should not be dependent on the intervention of any state such as Turkey or Iran. If the Iraqis are able to live in harmony amongst themselves and focus on Iraq, and their sole interest uh, be to develop Iraq, then no neighboring country can intervene in the affairs of Iraq as is happening today. However, due to these political differences between important political components in Iraq, this allows the opportunity for this country or that uh, to exploit this situation to the neighboring uh, countries and relations. But in most cases, that intervention was also welcomed. Uh, the northern side of Iraq did want to cooperate extensively uh, with the Turkish government. So it was a complicated relationship going on there. I'll turn to Mr. Wadi Habush. Um, uh, Mr. Habush, Habush Group is a big group that operates in the region. Most of our guests here might be wondering, what's going on in the ground in Iraq? Are there big companies there? Are they investing there? A lot of international focus has been on the northern region because the Kurdish region is obviously autonomous. So they have been uh, attracting a lot of investment. What's going on in the south? What kind of companies are operating there? What are you guys doing there? Can you just give us a general economic outlook uh, of the region? Sure. Um, so no, the, the, uh, you're absolutely right in terms of perception. Uh, as an Iraqi and as an Iraqi businessman, we, we unfortunately suffer from huge misperception of what is going on um, in the south of Iraq particularly, which is where we operate and where our group is uh, heavily interested. One, for various reasons. Um, uh, sure, the, uh, my native background is from that area, so that's what really uh, draws me into that region. But more so than that, it's not just that, but the economic dynamics are quite simple. I think the South um, offers uh, uh, huge potential. Um, when you look at it from a macroeconomic standpoint, you see the demographics. Um, and also looking at security, which is also fairly assessed, um, you look and you see, okay, where is, where is the oil coming from? Where is the natural resource? And the natural resource is from the south. Today, the majority of exports of oil come from Basra. There is no doubt this is, this is something that everybody, I think, in this room also knows. So, um, and and where, will, where are most of the reserves of Iraq? Where are 96% of the oil reserves of Iraq? They're from the south. So, um, and to answer your question in terms of are there operations or are these things just sort of there? No. Um, I would say there are operations. If you go to Basra, you do see a movement of the economy. You see energy companies there. Major oil companies have, uh, you know, have mobilized. They have, uh, you know, American companies, Western companies, Asian companies, the Chinese. Um, you know, we are there cooperating with all those um, uh, international players to uh, ensure that uh, their operations also work successfully and that they are utilizing the local, um, uh, the local labor force and the, uh, and the local uh, means to, to, uh, to execution and operation. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly simple that, you know, I, I go back to the fact that we have a misperception um, in the business world and in the business sector. Our international friends outside of our borders do not really see and they do not know um, what is really happening on the ground outside of Kurdistan, which has done a marvelous job, and I have to ap applaud them for their marvelous job in, in, uh, um, in, in presenting their region mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and, and really um, you know, saying, look, uh, we need to look at our future. We need to connect with the outside world, and we need to do it. Mm. Um, we lack that in the rest of Iraq. In the next round, I'll ask more specifics about the economic outlook. Can I turn to Mr. Zubaydi? Wadi Habush talks about Basra and how critical it is, obviously, for Iraq. Uh, as far as I remember, uh, there was a law that was passed to make Basra an economic capital, that is. Uh, it's a hub. It's a port. So uh, what has happened to that? Because during Maliki's time, uh, 
it has been somehow tabled and it hasn't been uh, executed. How does that help affect the overall economy of Iraq and why was that law tabled in your opinion? Maybe Saleh Mutlaq do that. Yeah. <laughs> because he's the deputy also. prime minister. <laughs> Let me first get your reaction and I'm, then I'll go. You know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, will, he will have the question as well. Basra al Asim al Iqtsadiya Taban Basra is the economic capital and Mr. Al Hakim in his visit uh, raised uh, this uh, project. It is an important project in any modern democratic state that wants its economy to move forward. This is the case in European countries and in, it is in Turkey. Istanbul is the economic capital and Istanbul uh, set the example for all the different governorates of Turkey. If we take, for example, the airport, or the Istanbul airport today, it hosts 1,200 planes a day. And this, of course, employs so many workers and receives so many tourists. It uh, receives a commercial movement. Now, I was entrusted as a head of uh, the Muwatin bloc the parliamentarian uh, bloc uh, to adopt the question of making uh, Basra the economic capital. And I thank all the different blocs. We were limited in number for in the recent elections. Yes, today we are number one, though we got the highest number of votes uh, in the different governorates, in the governorate councils. But in the last elections, we had a setback. And in spite of this, we were able to persuade all the different blocks uh, through meetings with the heads of the blocks uh, to uh, draft this law. And then it went through the different committees, the Finance Committee, the Reconstruction Committee, the Legal Committee, and then the, through the presidency. And then it was voted on. It got the highest number of votes. And the law was dr passed. But this law needs money in order really to turn the city into an economic capital to draw uh, the uh, interest of the world uh, to this city, to have international airports. As a civil engineer and as a businessman, I calculated it. About 250,000 jobs uh, would be created in the area. And there is unemployment there today. Unfortunately, our brothers in the government, and I want to ask Mr. Al Mutlaq, uh, perhaps he has the answer. What's happening now? <laughs> I ask you, sir, uh, to ask uh, to to take the uh, law out of the drawers uh, and to activate it. But there are, may I ask, there are allegations of uh, corruption towards Maliki's government, obviously. Iraq just had the provincial elections and the Maliki's party did not do so well. Now you have the general elections coming up as well. In light of all of these criticisms, we look at this, deterring relations with Turkey, uh, within inside the economic stagnation. Uh, how do you think the Maliki's party going to perform in the coming elections? And what are your reactions to the current uh, performance of uh, Maliki, since you are the Deputy Prime Minister? I mean, I know that you do not agree totally with everything Maliki is saying, and those some politicians you were talking about in your previous speeches, actually Maliki, but we are on record, so... Um, <laughs> you have to answer, you have to answer. <laughs> The main uh, ally of Al-Maliki is Mr. Uh, Al-Baqir. I worked with him three or four years. Uh, of these, I was in two years in and two years out of the government, in all cases. Seriously, I believe that corruption is a major problem in Iraq. However, if there is a political will from all the political groupings to combat financial corruption in Iraq, we would be able to achieve a boom in the country. But in all honesty, I have to say that most of the political blocs 
in Iraq are involved in the corruption that exists. Hence, uh, they pay lip service, uh, uh, but And this lip service covers the fact that there is no true intent uh, to hold accountable uh, the more important uh, symbols of this corruption. Had the intention existed to hold them accountable, the situation would have been different. But to hold these people accountable means to shake the foundations uh, of power. And then these blocks in parliament uh, will may be led to uh, withdraw confidence uh, from the prime minister, for example. So here, I'm not defending Maliki, and I'm well aware that perhaps uh, corruption uh, was most rampant during the last two governments, and both were headed by Maliki. The largest uh, demonstration of uh, corruption was during these two governments. So it is not just a matter of the state or the Maliki government, all the political groupings are involved in combating, ter uh, should be involved in combating terrorism. It means confronting those within each of the blocs who are involved in corruption. I want to move on to another topic that is very important, and we have not talked about this so far. Iraq is a rich country. It has uh, great wealth and it could build one of the greatest countries of the world. But one of the obstructions in the face of that is corruption. And it's not only financial corruption. We are speaking also of administrative corruption. Ever since the political process started and since uh, we established our new governments, we brought in uh, incompetent elements. We pushed away all the qualified people due to certain laws that were put in place by Bremer, and the politicians followed uh, in that path. Therefore, political leaders uh, found no administrative arms who could carry out their plans. Mr. Bayan Jabber spoke about Basra, and the capital needed for al-Basra. Today and over the last three years, we find that Basra was not able to uh, spend over 60% of the allocations made for it in the field of investment. There are monies, but there is no qualified administration for these funds. Why? Because uh, unqualified people were put in positions of responsibility. And this has been the case since the beginning of the political process in Iraq. We have the second or third uh, size of all reserves in the world. We are come tenth in gas reserves. Perhaps we are the first or the second in phosphate deposits. We have huge resources. We are the dry channel through which goods can be exported, and this can be a major source of returns for the country. Energy politics as well. Obviously, Iraq has gone through an invasion, a foreign invasion, and we are all sympathizing with the fact that uh, after any invasion, there's a painful uh, transition period, and it's not easy once all of your infrastructure has been bombarded into pieces. So we understand that, and we sympathize with that. To the specifics, I'll go back, but may I turn to His Eminence, uh, Al-Hakim. When you watch this, and when you see this whole picture, both within Iraq, the Shiites against the Sunnis, Sunnis against the Shiites and the Kurds, they're competing with each other. When you look at neighboring Syria as well. Our Muslim brothers are also being killed there by Assad's forces. Obviously, you are a supreme leader, and there is a surah in the Quran, in Maida. It says, if God had so willed, he would have made you one community. He has not done so in order to try all of you in competing with each other in good deeds. Uh, as the Muslims of Iraq, let me put it this way, do you feel that Muslims are living up to their book, or are they failing in that respect? Thank you. 
thank you. As I said in my intervention, uh, the complexity of the formula in Iraq and in the reasons uh, that have given rise uh, to sectarian strife, which is actually a political form of strife and not a sectarian one. And we have noted uh, that uh, over the long history of Iraq, uh, the Shiites and the Sunnis, the Christians and the Kurds and the Yazidis and the uh, uh, Sabiyas, uh, all of them lived together and intermarried. Nobody asked his neighbor what were. Uh, what his sect uh, was, and uh, nobody cared if his wife or uh, a relative was from this or that sect. There has been an exploitation of this matter going uh, beyond uh, uh, the borders of Iraq, and the Iraqis, whether Sunni or Shia, became the victims of this agenda. In 2006, and after uh, this uh, pace, we found that the Iraqis soon went back uh, to their former harmony when the extremists were curbed. Recently, there have been other efforts made by these extremist forces exploiting uh, the regional tension that we are all, all witnessing in the region. And the Syrian situation is one of these considerations. We are for democracy and freedom in Syria. We are in a peaceful turnover of power. We are for free uh, and transparent uh, elections. We want the Syrian people to run their own affairs. Yet. We are uh, for the peaceful people to take up uh, uh, the role uh, to take up uh, the role needed. We have seen some extremist uh, elements uh, acting with bloody brutality and uh, making calls uh, of God is great. Uh, this is not Islam and this is not democracy. And what will happen if such people attain power? What will they do to the Syrians, firstly? And what will they do to the neighboring region? We in Iraq feel very concerned about such behavior. And we hope that there will be a peaceful political solution that will enable uh, the Syrians to regain the initiative and run their own affairs. All this has created tension within Iraq, and some extremist groups uh, have uh, hardened their position depending on the situation in Syria. The regional situation is impacted by what is happening in the region. Hence, we need a regional solution, a regional, misun regional understandings uh, to address this. We feel that the understanding between the different uh, political forces is much better than before. There may be certain uh, ob reservations on this or that political personality, yet there is dialogue, there are deliberations, and we have the opportunity to bring together our home, our internal home, and move ahead. They actualize. I want to go back to Wadi Habush. Uh, Wadi, obviously, this is a World Economic Forum meeting, so there are many young professionals, also businessmen. You are, uh, you've educated yourself in the States, and you actually have offices in Turkey, in the United States, in other places. If you want to give out a message here, there are many expat Iraqis that live outside of Iraq, obviously, uh, and some people are hesitant about coming and investing in Iraq. What would be some of the, your message would be to your fellow businessmen or to fellow investors who would want to come? Uh, what will be some of the challenges and risks that face them? And what will be the advantages of coming to Iraq to invest? Um, so, you know, we, I face this uh, challenge uh, pretty much every day um, in dealing with uh, foreign partners and also in uh, dealing with, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Iraqi expatriates who are living overseas and have spent their life pretty much overseas waiting in exile for the right time to come back home, um, which came to us in 2003. Um, and that's what really brought me back and hold me back to, to, my, to my native grounds. So, uh, you know, but, but the challenge is, is twofold. One is for the Iraqi living overseas. Um, a lot of them have accustomed their lives to being overseas. And a lot of them have actually accustomed their business, their commerce, to being part of those communities. So it's very, very hard for them to actually even come back to Iraq and reestablish 
themselves on the ground and build the foundation from scratch. And, and it's not just building a foundation and moving an office or moving people, but it's actually also a cultural issue. We live in a country today where there is a disparity between, um, as you mentioned, you know, uh, young business leaders. There, there is a disparity in my generation. And I see it by being on the ground in Iraq. And one of the main reasons of why I want to rebuild my business in Iraq is to really help my country as a lot of the political, uh, our friends, political friends are here to work on the political side. In my side, I want to really give back to my community by building a business mm -hmm. because I'm not a politician. So by, you know, so, so this is one of the major aspects that um, I do see is by really becoming the bridge of bringing back all those utilities that we were able to learn overseas and, you know, let's call them sophisticated methodologies or business practices or, you know, uh, et cetera. Bring those back so that my generation, all that time that has actually surpassed where they have not been able to, to educate themselves or learn or really have a, let's say, uh, a freezing between what's happening inside of the country and what's happening outside of the country. The mere fact of globalization is something that a lot of Iraqis don't really understand to date still. Uh, or if they do understand it, it's not, you know, understanding is not enough, but it's also about execution. How do you execute globalization? How do you bring Iraq back into the global business community? So, uh, you know, and then when you talk to the other side, which is the foreign partners, and you're trying to convince them in Iraq, as an Iraqi, look, whether they're from the region or whether they are from Asia, from America, the, the, you know, a, a lot of the questions come again back to what I said earlier, perception. Perception of security issues, perception of corruption, of what you addressed with uh, His Excellency the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, you know, uh, and, 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 and I try to fight these. I try to fight these risks by mitigating these risks for them, um, uh, helping them give, you know, giving them a, a different understanding of what's going. So my message is, if anybody really is really interested in doing something in Iraq, or if you are Let's say you have a little bit of doubt in Iraq. Let me help you release that doubt. Come with me, visit Basra, you will be my guest. I will show you around and you will not need 10 or 15 bodyguards with armored vehicles taking you around. You, do not, you will feel safe, you will feel the Basra hospitality, the southern hospitality, the Iraqi hospitality. The generosity of the people on An the ground. An open invitation, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. to the businessmen yes, in actually, this room. Yes, actually, so the, ab we absolutely, this is an that, open so invitation. You could meet Mr. Habush the, after the session. This is an uh, open invitation to anybody who wants to visit south of Iraq. Kurt is a world economic uh, forum. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but true, what you said is true, and I think it's important. A family legacy is important, and a legacy for a country. So I think... Um, besides the uh, obviously the informal part of it but it's important to go back and I think that uh, has a lot of challenges that come with it. Uh, I would like to turn to His Excellency Mr. Zubaydi. Do you have uh, an economic model uh, or a political model that you see for Iraq? Obviously oil politics is a major part of Iraqi economy. I know that there are a few projects on the table and the capacity of oil production actually could rise. So what is the situation there? If you could uh, draw us the big picture, uh, what should Iraq do? What kind of oil pipelines should be built or should be reactivated? Uh, what is needed there in that respect? The Ministry of Oil and the Government of Iraq have actually started signing contracts, uh, service contracts, uh, and ever since the very beginning I have said very clearly at the ministry, at the uh, Prime Minister's office, I have said that such contracts uh, cannot actually be executed because there are, uh, there are no companies who would like to come uh, and serve a country without gaining profits. I believe that any company would like to get profits from any investment and at the end of the day the government decided not to turn to these service contracts and not to turn to what is known as sharing revenue contracts. They decided to turn to bidding. That is to say they turned to international companies and they brought them to Iraq. Unfortunately, no prior planning took place, no prior planning in order to build new pipelines, uh, pipelines for this oil that is going to be extracted and how that oil that is going to be extracted is going to be exported. Unfortunately, there were no such plans and the Ministry of Oil has failed, uh, hence uh, in increasing the oil productivity in Iraq. It turned to those international companies in order to enhance or to increase uh, productivity 
productivity but unfortunately once they have increased productivity there were no pipelines in order to transport that oil and I think that that problem has not yet been settled as it should have been and according to the contracts that uh, were signed we were supposed to export 10 to 12 million barrels of oil every day uh, now we are exporting around 3 million uh, barrels of oil per day of course uh, we have achieved some progress unfortunately we uh, have problems when it comes to licensing for example the uh, prices that are given by companies in order to buy pens for example pens that you can buy for one dollar in the market you'd see that those company companies are considering the price of those pens to be thirty dollars or um, a watch that you can buy for ten dollars is written down as being a watch for three thousand dollars now this is one of the major problems that we are facing and i personally believe that we need to increase productivity because we are growing as a country and we have at, we are achieving great growth because of the real economic growth that is taking place in iraq we have industrial growth we have agricultural growth and we are achieving growth and progress on all levels including when it comes to the sale of oil but we cannot depend only on the selling of oil. We need to enhance our revenues that are not oil generated because any country that has oil can increase its oil generated revenues. I believe that we have a problem with Kurdistan because we, ha we are negotiating with uh, Kurdistan, we are discussing the, a number of contracts with Kurdistan, we don't know if Kurdistan is going to build pipelines through Turkey or not. Last. Yes. Uh, this situation... Because he is the deputy prime minister. Prime minister, yes. <laughs> the situation in, uh, in the north is a bit complicated. Turkey... Why don't you continue with... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is your job. This is I your job. With questions. <laughs> Let's see, the, uh, coming back to the subject. Uh, uh, the Turkish government, to just inform our audience, has signed contracts with the northern uh, uh, Kurdish region uh, with ExxonMobil to uh, drive oil from there. And they've been doing that so because the Turkish energy minister says 19 countries are operating there. There are like 40 companies in the north. Why should we not uh, do business with the northern region? But that's bypassing the central government, which is... Uh, the Maliki government. So what is your take on that, uh, the increased cooperation between the Turkish government and the Kurdish region? And what does the Maliki standpoint, the government standpoint? <laughs> this is by far the most interactive session of the whole uh, forum, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Please. Look, if the problems, uh, now, the problem between Iraq and Turkey was over-personalized and it was inflated. Turkey refused to build such a pipeline between Kurdistan and Turkey. However, in the past few days and because of um, the situation that we are witnessing, each country is trying to focus on its own priorities. I personally don't agree with this. I don't think that Kurdistan I don't think that Kurdistan should deal with companies in a way that is different uh, than the way the central government uh, is dealing with those companies because Kurdistan at the end of the day is part of Iraq. We need a unified oil policy for the entire of Iraq. Otherwise, we are not talking about one country. We're talking about two different states and each state has its own policies and its own way of doing things. This is my own personal point of view. I think that many people might criticize me for this point of view, but this is my personal opinion. I believe that uh, this is not something that should be tolerated and I believe that uh, any agreement between any part of Iraq and any other country should go through the central government. Uh, any dealings and any cooperation between any part of Iraq and any other part of any other, other, of any other country should be through the central government and in cooperation with the central government. Uh, 
Croatian government and uh, even the US administration knows about that. So the situation in the ground and the situation in Baghdad are completely different at this point. I'd like to turn to the audience right now if there are any questions. Please, sir. <coughs> Is there a microphone for the gentleman? My name is Dr. Goktuna. I'm from Istanbul, an ex-international. My question goes to Deputy Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. A simple question. And we wanted to work in Santa, with the Santa Government Iraq projects, state projects, and were turned back. They said that Turkish companies are not welcomed. Mm -hmm. Are we boycotted or not? Would like to have a clear answer, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will first get all of the questions and then give the floor to our panelists. Any other questions? Yes, sir. May I have a microphone? Uh, I am Shaker Wajed and I head Dana Gas Company in Kurdistan. I actually don't have a question, I have a comment. A comment about the real problem in Iraq. The real problem in Iraq has to do with the fact that two laws were issued, two very bold laws, a law, a law about oil and gas and a law about the distribution of revenues in the country and uh, the, dis the distribution of the resources of the country too. I would like to correct some of your information about <coughs> relation between the Turkish government and the Iraqi government regarding energy and oil. First, you have to go to the Iraqi constitution. There are articles 111, 12, and 15, which really regulate the work between the region and the central government. And the second thing, I agree with the Deputy Prime Minister, you cannot have a region anywhere in international law can work independently from its federal government. Thank you. I agree with you, sir, and I think that is the right, the Constitution says that, but I have to say as a moderator that the situation in the ground is different than what the Constitution says, so in order to clarify, yes. Hello, Saz Bayan. My question goes to Mr. Bayan. What are your expectations about the situation, the security and political situation in Iraq in the coming few months? Questions from the audience, if there are any? Okay, if there are no further questions, I'm going to go back to our... Okay, one more, let's take that as well. We know that uh, all advanced democratic states uh, have political parties, two political parties in Britain. We have two political parties, two main political parties in the US. We also have two key political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. And I would like to turn to the politicians here in this room and I would like to ask you, when do you think that we might see only two political parties in Iraq? My second question, the Iraqi constitution states that uh, the economy in Iraq must be a free economy. However, after 10 years, uh, we still have not seen a free economy in Iraq, and we have not even seen any indication that there will be a free economy in Iraq. When do you think we'll be able to have a free economy in Iraq? Let me start with the, the Deputy Prime Minister, Al Mutlaq. Uh, you've heard the questions. Uh, yeah. Yani first so, I believe that uh, my, uh, the person who asked the question actually agreed with what I said, so I will not uh, attempt to reply to what he said. Your question, sir. I personally, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that there is any decision that has been taken within the 
Iraqi government to boycott uh, Turkish companies. However, there are some people who make statements here and there. However, from a legal point of view, no minister, no prime minister, and no de deputy prime minister can prevent any Turkish company from dealing or from having business in Iraq. There was no decision taken in this field. There was no agreement on this. And I don't think that we uh, need to do this. We must not boycott uh, Turkish companies. We are welcoming Turkish companies in Iraq. They are more than welcome in Iraq. And if there are some problems in Iraq, I believe, and some problems between Iraq and Turkey, I believe that we, as good neighbors, we have proven that we are quite capable of cooperating with each other and of building strong economic and political ties on, in all fields so that we can achieve the development of both countries. This cooperation is very important and this political cooperation is very important. Uh, any conflicts in this field would actually harm both countries and we must uh, avoid them. Security concept there but Be also as I came from the... Before, before the security some questions. Yes, administrative Two questions problems. about uh, how to distribute uh, uh, the Sharing budget. Revenue. Uh, Sharing revenue. Yes, yes. And also about the law. Uh, the oil and gas law, it was adopted in 2007. And then within the Council of Ministers, there was a problem when it comes to this law. There was no agreement on this law and it was postponed. I personally believe that it should not have been postponed because delaying the adoption and the implementation of this law would, would only make the situation more complex. Unfortunately, this law was not endorsed and a different law actually was endorsed in 2009, a different law. It is now ready. So we have this law from 2007 and another law from 2009. I personally believe that this law should be endorsed and should be implemented as quickly as possible. I believe that the key political blocs in Iraq have actually agreed more or less on the importance of these two uh, laws because we know that the situation on the ground is different. We know that uh, in Kurdistan they have started digging for oil and gas. Now I think that uh, Basra and any other region does not have the right to export its, its uh, um, oil or its uh, gas to Soleimania or um, to any other country or Soleimania does not have the right to export its own gas and oil. This gas and oil is the property of the Iraqi population and I believe that all the revenues of the selling of this gas and oil has to come to the central government through the DFI because we uh, know that we are still working under this DFI agreement, we're still paying um, compensation to Kuwait, and I am quite astonished why some people are talking about the distribution of the riches or the distribution of the revenues of oil and gas. We have one budget. This budget has different uh, uh, categories and this budget sometimes uh, has deficits and uh, we have the public budget of the state that has to be adopted by the Council of Ministers and by the Parliament and then by the President's office and then this budget can be adopted and it becomes a law. Now, now speaking about the distribution of revenues, I know that some people are speaking about this and have been speaking about this ever since 2007, but I believe that we must not distribute revenues in this way. We need to create different funds maybe. We need to have 10, maybe 10 different DFIs. It is, I know that it is difficult to have more than one DFI because we need to ensure that the central government controls its funds and controls its budget. I think that the constitution is very clear. It says that the oil and gas of Iraq are the property of the population of Iraq and have to be distributed in line with the, uh, popu the, number, or the, um, the number of citizens and the population of Iraq. Now, there are some uh, problems uh, that have not been settled yet. We don't know whether these... Uh, um, Grievances, we, we have a number of grievances. We don't know whether these grievances come uh, from uh, the pre-Saddam era or from after the fall of Saddam era. And anyway, when it comes to the other question about the two key political parties, 
It is true that there are two political parties in Great Britain and also in the USA and in other countries, but this is the result of more than 300 years of democratic process. Whereas we in Iraq, we are, democracy is recent in Iraq. And I believe that the number of political parties have actually been, re has actually been reduced over the past years and it shall be reduced in the future. And maybe one day we'll only have two political parties. Uh, quite, quite Mr. Thanks, and Mr. <laughs> Mutlak, you want to say? <laughs> May I turn to His Eminence, uh, Mr. Hakim? When I hear about oil production and different stakes, uh, Kirkuk comes to my mind. So I would like to know your personal opinion about the future of Kirkuk. For our audience here, it's a very oil-rich region, but different sects have different claims on that region. The situation on the ground is very delicate. As a Supreme Leader, what are your hopes and what are your expectations concerning the future of Kirkuk? Because it's an asset for all of Iraq, obviously, but it seems that some uh, uh, conflict might arise any time there. Thank you. If you allow me, I'd like to go back to the question about two political parties. I believe that this is very important. Uh, I don't think that we will have two political bar parties by reducing the number of parties gradually. What we need to do is to have a clear political path that uh, does uh, that does not have political or religious affiliations. And this way, and of course with a number of years, we'll be able to have two political parties. The uh, layman in Iraq is now more ready to accept certain political stances that were not accepted maybe five or ten years ago. We have the unified coalition in Iraq and we had Jabhat at tawafuq which had its own um, way of thinking and at tawafuq um, block had also its own way of thinking and nobody in the past would have thought or could have thought that somebody from one of these factions or from one of those blocks would come out with an opinion that is different different from the opinion of the bloc to which he or she belongs. Now in Erbil we see that some people are thinking out of the box, they are thinking in a way that is different. So this means that we are actually building a political uh, faction that uh, does not belong to a certain political or certain religious affiliations. Now, Mr. Saleh al-Mutlaq today, who is part of the government, and some of his colleagues are no longer part of the government, we hope to see them back in the government, but just this shows us that we are a modern and advanced country that is more diverse, politically speaking, than it was in the past. And now, His Eminence, what would you say about the future of Kirkuk? Yes, <laughs> Kirkuk. When it comes to Kirkuk, I believe that Kirkuk is, belongs to the people of Kirkuk and we need to give to the people of Kirkuk, whether they are Arab or Turkmen, Christians or Muslims, we need to give them back what belongs to them because Kirkuk actually is an example of the diversity that we have in Iraq. It's hard for us to come here and to judge the situation in Kirkuk and to say that Kirkuk belongs, belongs to this or that faction or to this or that category of the population. We need to give the people of Kirkuk a say in the matter and I believe that if they ask us our opinion we would tell them that the best thing to do would be to agree on a common way to administer Kirkuk. Talking about uh, Kirkuk and talking about uh, certain minorities or majorities in Kirkuk could have huge repercussions on the country as a whole. I believe that we need to respect the diversity of the city and to respect uh, the needs of the entire population of Kirkuk regardless of their political or sectarian affiliations. Yeah. The word to Mr. Mutlak and the last word would go to Mr. Wadi Habush. Okay. <laughs> I would like to second what was said by Mr. Al-Hakim. It is true that we need political parties that 
are not restricted to certain political or to certain religious affiliations that are cross-sectarian. We need to do that in order to have strong political parties in the country. When we established the dialogue block in Iraq in 2004, we participated in the elections at the time and there were other blocs taking part in those elections, blocs that were Sunni and other blocs that were Shia. And ever since those elections back in 2004, we understood that we needed cross-sectarian political parties. Otherwise, we will hinder the development of the country. It is true that we did not win many votes. We did win some votes. We did secure some votes. And we knew that those votes would provide us with the nucleus that would enable us to grow in the future. I believe that the solution would be what was said by Mr. Al-Hakim. We need political parties that are cross-sectarian, that, um, that would make citizens feel that they belong to Iraq and not to certain political or religious sects. To the lady here, we have a question. I have a question uh, regarding the United States. As a most uh, educated people, I know that they still have the region historically and the most cultured people. I don't, think, I don't see why the people of Iraq cannot build their, uh, their country. My question to the politicians, Mike. Uh, isn't it that if they improve the public service delivery, if they treat their, customer, their clients Mike to customers, to make their and look for customer satisfaction, and uh, uh, make equity and fairness in delivering the services, don't you think that people will, will forget all about their clashes, about their political and uh, religious conflicts? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I would direct this question actually to Wadi Habush because he's a businessman and he uh, represents the young generation as well. You've been overseas as well. So what the lady is saying, rightly so, uh, what kind of expectations? Iraq obviously has an important legacy in world history, cradle of civilizations. Baghdad was very important. I had the luxury of having visited Baghdad, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It was just before the war. And then it was very painful to see it get bombarded into pieces, obviously. So obviously difficult times, painful transition periods. Wadi, what, as a businessman and as a young Iraqi as well, what are your expectations? Uh, what would you like the politicians to achieve there? And what's your future outlook? I think to answer to the ladies' comments, um, I think the question is, is, is fairly simple, which is, you're right, Iraq does have, the Iraq is, geopolitically well positioned. Um, uh, the socio-dynamic of Iraq is uh, a mosaic as His Eminence laid out. Um, I grew up uh, even, you know, knowing, not knowing what, what is religion, what is sectarianism, um, what is ethnicity. We had neighbors that we really didn't even, I didn't even know, um, you know, what their religion was, but they were brothers and sisters to me, uh, complete strangers. So, uh, you know, as an Iraqi, I, I, uh, I, I second the lady in terms of Iraqi people being very cultured, um, historically uh, being very sensitive, multiculturally sensitive people. And they, and they remain to be, by the way. Um, and that's why I, I extended an invitation to everybody to see that. But, but I think what we have is really, it's, uh, and, and to put it really out front, it is a political uh, question, nothing more. It's not a question of culture, it's not a question of religion, it's not a question of society, it's a question of, uh, it's a political balance. And I think it goes back to management because I'm a businessman and I believe everything has management. You, fa you manage your family, you manage your friends, you manage your life, you manage your business, and you manage your country if you're a politician. And I think what I like about this discussion, and this is what I encourage everybody here to see, especially our, our foreign, non-Iraqi friends, Suna, is that this is the democratic Iraq, what we see here today. We see Dr. Saleh al-Mutlaq giving his point of view. We see uh, His Excellency al-Zubaydi giving his point of view. Democratic uh, and very interactive. Exactly. And, and, and as you can see, we're all very friendly with all, each other. Always we are. And, and His Eminence, <laughs> and you know, of course, and, and, with, and with respect to the wisdom of His, of his Eminence and, and the family background that he comes from and, and, um, and, and the religious um, uh, position that he has, that we all respect regardless of where we are from in Iraq, is what makes up this is just a small mosaic of what Iraq is really about. So this is democracy. And I'm glad to see this uh, with, with a Turk as a moderator, by the way. And, and not just any Turk, but Sunna Vidindli. You know, but but this, is, this, this is what really uh, is an example of Iraq. So, um, you know, I think 
to, to sort of end it and to sum it up, I think Iraq is, um, uh, is, is at the point where we, we are refining our management, um, uh, we are refining our management skills. We are realizing that there are administrators that uh, failed. There are administrators who tried, who failed, and, and that's fine. Now it's a chance to give to others an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's about, you know, but, but again, we also come from a culture and I think this is a broader Middle Eastern culture of being, um, uh, you know, falling in love or being attached to a position. And it's not just politicians, but even business people. We as business people get attached to, you know, and we fall in love with where we position ourselves. So, uh, I think... Uh, yeah, I'll give one more uh, word to Mr. I need one, one minute. Sure. Because sure. I don't neglect it's not just the my prime minister question about the security. Yeah. <laughs> the question of the security. I think that the I believe the security solution for Iraq, and I believe most of those present with us here are from Iraq, is a very difficult uh, solution. Therefore, I call upon the Iraqi government and all those who are demonstrating in the streets to be wise uh, and to resort to reason. We are one country, one people. We have a long-standing history. We should unite and solve our problems with reason and wisdom. And we do hope to we do hope to continue this conversation next year in the World Economic Forum on the Middle East and North Africa, which is going to take place in Istanbul. So we hope by then that there will be less people dying, both in Iraq and Syria, and that we live up to the book, what the book, the Quran, uh, says as Muslims and as Iraqis. Hopefully, thank you so much. Thank you.